So if you're attending presentations I'm doing this week, you're not going to, uh, you'll get tired of this very rapidly. But I was so tired of looking at slide after slide of pictures of shipping containers <laughs> that, that I said, OK, let's go with Tupperware. I mean, because you know it has the same isolation properties. Things smell bad if you're not securing it. So anyway, um, I want to start talking about concerns in general and specifically in the area of uh, container security. Go on to some breakdowns of best practices and areas in which we specifically address some things. And then talk stuff I think half of the audience will already know, which is what we do about security and how we handle security at SUSE. And then um, I'm the lucky guy who, in both of my presentations, gets to have more than one some other stuff to do at SUSECon slide. Um, here, because I have a container slide and a security slide, and in the other one where we were doing the CASP roadmap, we decided we would put everything that has anything to do with what we were doing on it, and we have like three slides of other sessions to do, um, you know, half of which will probably be done by the time we do it the first time, but oh well. So, I'm going to ask a question, and this might be more fun in a larger room, or room of the same size with the larger populations. But, you know, I'm, I'm, do you agree, disagree, or have some other response to this statement? Depends on how you see it. That's it! That's it, right? Um, that there are a lot of people who are slowing their adoption because of a belief that containers are inherently insecure. Um, and the fact is, there are some things about containers that are potentially less secure than other things. There are, at the same time, things that are architecturally more secure than, say, VMs or running on a host. And then there are other things that are absolutely down to configuration and down to tooling. So breaking down where people are at, this is a study that ESG did. Um, I'm going to average it out to, to, to a year and a half ago, it was sometime in 2017. We'll just, we'll just oh. guess that it was oh, uh, anywhere from, you know, anywhere from two Okay, so that is a study, right? Yeah. Okay, so I mean, there's a lot of them to disagree. Right, and there's samples, right. right. And, and this is just right. of, this, this, this really is a, a sample of close to 300 CIOs and IT managers and so on. And these are just statements that were made in, in the solution. These are, these are interesting not as truth statements, but as beliefs. Um, the first one is kind of a no-brainer. Yes, containers have security implications. I mean, that's true because everything you do has security implications. Um, when people have said, I think, worried about the lack of mature security solutions for containers, Largely what they were saying was they are worried about the fact that the tools that they're using right then were not really good at doing containers. I would be really interested in, in getting your view on that. Yeah. I, mean, I, I have a few on and it's not a good view. Then we get into, well, Current security, yeah, so the second one is, the third one rather, at the same percentage, is really a restatement of the other. So I'm not really sure if that's, uh, that is anywhere from 31% of, you know, the same 31% saying it to a total of 62% being uh, unhappy about the tools or think they are unhappy about the tools to anywhere in between. Um, I think the, in the next to last point, the um, the thing in question is the word easily. You can do a lot to mitigate that. And we'll talk about some of the things that you can do. And as for the last, um, yeah, since things are in motion a lot more, if the networks are not protected, sure they can be compromised in motion. So the answer to that is, well, protect. 
I mean, data, data in motion encryption is a key feature, as we'll see, and you sort of have to go out of your way not to get it. So let's look at a high level list of requirements, and um, most of these are honestly this, uh, um, I'm not quite organized enough to have created uh, this list. This, this list actually comes uh, with some editing to take out their recommendations from a recent Gartner study. And you know, it's pretty good. We added some, we added a couple, and we added commentary to some. But let's take a look at what each one, each one of these means. So first of all, and I'm going to go through these talking a little bit about the, about the vulnerabilities or the, the things to watch out for, and then talk about best practices in delivery. So both container hosts and containers should be built on a well-secured, analyzed, minimal, for some value of minimal, which we'll get to, host operating system. And then containers really should have just the things they need in. And we start by building Goldmaster Host in, in uh, cast, cast Platform 3 is, of course, the micro OS that we ship. If you're interested in finding out why I said CAST Platform 3, come to the roadmap presentations tomorrow or th uh, yeah, tomorrow or Friday morning, and you'll find out what we're doing in CAST Platform 4. But you kind of already know. Uh, <laughs> um, and really, to, to secure the pathway from in the containers from development through deployment, Use a, use a, a trusted, well-secured CI-CD pipeline. And one of the approaches to that is to do this on CAP, on, on the cloud application platform. It's not the only approach. It's a great approach for 12-factor applications. But there are other Kubernetes native technologies or Kubernetes uh, ecosystem technologies that can be used to do that as well. I mean, we use in our in our uh, test CI/CD environment, for example, we um, we use Jenkins X to run our test suites now. Uh, there are many approaches, but the key is to keep the data movement in the pipeline and keep the machines in the pipeline secured as well. Oops. Role-based access control. Use it. <laughs> I mean, it took us long enough to get people used to doing that the right way in, <laughs> in other solutions. Um, and I'm going to, there, there are recommendations here that go from most secure to really not secure. Um, the best thing to do is for every service or every application to have a service account that has only the privileges it needs. Yeah, well, well, the first one I have a, like, after sentence. Yeah. And don't use the default service at all. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, so note the default service account is two levels down in security. It's more secure than the really bad things, but in general, don't do it. Right, the next thing is, Create a service when, account. When an incident, like, uh, since user management is kind of difficult, yeah. um, our training guys put 500 people through training. And what they did is, OK, they basically granted the default service account cluster admin and, and basically gave the cube configs to the attendees. <laughs> yeah, so chaos with that, chaos with that like, anything you deploy in this cluster admin, game over. Yeah. Um, so the, the comment was trainers gave the default service account, gave the cluster admin account to students, and um, hilarity ensued, I guess. Um, but 
We do um, that, but we give each other, each of them their own cluster pair. So that way they can only break their own. <laughs> no, that's a, the tennis didn't find out. So. Okay. Yeah, I, 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 I had a complaint about this. Uh, okay. Guys, you shouldn't be doing this. Yeah, in, in their case, because they do want to teach everything for the whole cluster, it's reasonable. But if you're if you're teaching at the app level, use service accounts at the app level. Um, in your case, I, I would, from what I know about Gardner, you kind of have to do something around here, right? Because you have it's to exactly the same. Do because you have to build yourself. You, no, oh, no, okay. But that, I'm sorry. I'm thinking data. I mean, that was. I thought data hub for a minute. Never mind. No, no, I'm sorry. What we do is exactly the same. Yeah, data hub may have to do this because it needs to build. It needs to build things. So it may need that. But, but but this is you know this is this is best. This is second best. Default service account is a really bad idea, but not as bad as turning our back off completely. Um, and there are people who do that. Uh, and or or give everything to everything to cube system, which is even worse than um, <coughs> admin because it, it gives you all this all the cluster workloads to all the native Kubernetes workloads as well. Okay, scanning images, security scanning. The best way, best thing to do here <coughs> is to use in your in your build. Path use systems that perform IRS scanning. So SUSE Manager will do it for containers that are built in SUSE Manager. Um, Third-party scanners, we talked about a couple of um, SUSE CAS platform ready partners here. Um, I name them only not out of preference, but because they're certified. Um, and, and of course, you can always bring both other third-party solutions or um, open-source solutions such as Claire. Uh, you know, this will be able to deal with all of these. Will be able to deal looking at the code, identifying CVEs and other known vulnerabilities as they encounter them. Network policies are coming on strong. Um, we'll talk about other security policies in a bit, but network policies in particular are, I guess this sort of became part of the roadmap presentation, um, but we've been pretty open about this for a while, that the networking in the CAS Platform 4 will be based, or the, the default will be based on a new CNI plugin in Cilium, uh, and Flannel will still be available but Flannel is limited by the fact that it's flat networking and imposes no security or policies. Cilium allows you to construct more complex network topologies and most important, can control via policy access not only to the cluster, but between services on the cluster. Uh, so uh, in ingress and egress to the cluster, ingress and egress between namespaces. Uh, and can leverage can be used for most of the roles of what we now do with an ingress controller, but also um, still the current or new ingress controllers for adding policy, integrating with load balancers, and so on, continue to be available. Um, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but when I, when I talk about one, one general principle, which is that we're going to talk a lot about containers, but they still run on the platform, we're going to take one of the concerns of the platform up a little bit, and that is where most people, most IT organizations at any rate, are used to thinking at least to some extent about network security. Here we have the ability to bring those network security capabilities into the environment also. So we can have, beyond the network policies, we can use container firewalls from partners that are more explicit about uh, data policy and packet types and all of the other things you expect from a firewall between containers. Let's talk about visibility. Containers can 
people can think of containers sometimes as being lots of little black boxes, but they don't need to be. You can monitor lots of things. Network, you know, also, also at runtime levels, workload levels, etc. cetera. Um, and there are third-party solutions that are pretty good, and if you go to the showcase, you'll see um, some great stuff. But there is native Kubernetes capability or Kubernetes ecosystem capability to do these things. Uh, you can either take your own Prometheus from upstream for CAS Platform 3. Um, you'll actually see if you go to a cloud application platform session, a CAP session, um, or the CAP demos in there, wherever it is. Um, you'll see that they've incorporated Prometheus and do some basic basic security stuff in and performance stuff in uh, Stratos, which is the cloud application platform UI. Uh, but in CAS Platform 4, we will be delivering Prometheus uh, as well as Grafana for visualization of Prometheus. And as I said, trust, trust and value our partners. Some of them are, are showing their wares in the tech. Got it. I have a question. Why yeah. go into the labor cast form? That's a good question. Come to the roadmap presentation tomorrow on Friday. OK. Um, I'll tell you where we mean for summer. Right. We've, we, we took a lot of stuff that we were planning to do for 2020 and accelerated it. So it's taking a little longer, but I, I think it will meet a lot of people's needs and demands that if we had taken it slower, it would have taken a while longer to get to. Okay, encryption in motion. As I said, um, this is a tough one in general to get wrong. Yet some people go out of their way to do it. Um, out of the box, we deliver cluster signed certificates that manage the data paths not only in and out of the cluster, but within the cluster. So all data in motion in the cluster is already encrypted with the self-signed certificates that are cluster signed certificates. But many enterprises, especially if they're running administration from a browser, or if they're connecting to external programs and want to access the API uh, don't want to deal with certificate warnings on self-signed certificates. So one of the things we made easier to do later in CAS Platform 3, if you're, if you're a user of CAS Platform 3, you may notice um, if you either look carefully at what's going on or read my blog or do a bunch of other things, that we've delivered some features not in a release, but in maintenance, in, through the maintenance channel. And one of the ones that we did through maintenance channel late in uh, 2018 was the ability to install um, trusted root or externally issued certificates for the public interfaces. We don't allow it to be used, or you don't simplify using them anyway, uh, deep in the system. But for anything that talks to the outside world, which at this point is Vellum, the web UI for configuration, uh, interestingly, the place that you install the certificates uses this interface. Um, the API server and DEX, which is the directory server, uh, you can replace those certificates with trusted root or, or external CA issued certificates. Um, and, and that'll just be a cleaner experience for people. Secret management. Well, the worst practice is pretty explicit here, which is putting secrets like passwords embedded in containers. The second worst approach is a pretty common one, which is mounting them to the containers and storing them persistently 
in host file system files. And that can be, yeah. I don't know, but secrets and Kubernetes are more from a RAM disk. Yeah. So well, it's not well, RAM so disk is still RAM disk is still accessible, though. Yeah, really, but, it's, but it's still. It's generally difficult. Well, yes, but um, somewhat more flexible, well, about as flexible, but somewhat more trusted is to use environment variables. Um, and the better part, if you're using them, is if you're using mounted secrets, uh, is to use is to enable encryption at rest, which will keep that file so the RAM disk also encrypted. It is not a. It's currently like in one, at one thirteen. Your queue to ask me about Kubernetes releases, and I'll tell you. Wait for the roadmap. Um, but in, in 110, where we are now, it's either alpha or beta. In 113, one, well, 114 was just released. So in 113 and 114, it is, um, it's still beta. It's expected to be released into stable soon. Now, as you probably know, we disable the feature dates for alpha features, but we enable the feature dates and say that they're not supported for beta features. Uh, so this is available. It, you know, it's one of the beta features that, that clearly doesn't break support significantly. So it's a good idea. And then consider things like HashiCorp's fault for, you know, as environments grow and there are more and more of them, consider an external store for secrets that's more secure and better better at accessing. Runtime security, one of the things we're most grateful for that came along in the CASP 3 time frame for us was bot security policies. So it's much more fine-grained control, well, any control at the pod level. Um, controlling things like privileged containers, hint, you know, if you can avoid it. Uh, use of host resources, uh, the ability to, to escalate privilege, uh, the, the Linux capabilities system, uh, OS security profiles like uh, SE Linux, AppArmor, uh, these can all be controlled in pod security policies. Take as much as you can a least privileged approach. Give things only what they need, and you know it's better in general to start with as, as little as you possibly can, and in development and QA phase, let things fail. And that's when you open, that's when you open the doors one by one that you need, not the opposite way. You, know, you want an environment that is closed by default. One more thing, don't forget that all of this stuff's running on a platform. So there are general platform security concerns that don't go out the window. You still need to protect the operating system. You still need to protect the profiles for all of the base functions of the operating system still need to provide physical security. You still need to provide, if you're running in a VM environment, in a containers on VMs environment, you still want to deal with that with virtual network security and run, uh, you know, all, all too often, um, people have just as they have done when they didn't have network security protection at the container level, is leave things open in the host. Of course, they became, as in, uh, multi-tenant environments, people needed to become more aware of that. But that really applies as much at the virtual platform layer, layer to things between workloads that, or VMs that really have no need to talk to each other. Um, some people de deploy virtual firewalls just as a cheap 
or, or virtual network security as a cheap way to get network security, and then really don't think about it protecting inside the virtual network. Uh, but especially when you look at, at NSX, the new VMware approach, um, it's especially strong inside the network. And then just, just think about the same things that you want to block on the outside, you know, um, besides basic firewalling, uh, application-based firewalling or application control, uh, web application firewalls, uh, anti-malware still using things like not just AV but, but sandboxing capabilities, and storage and cloud security policies. So, so Keep the whole environment up. Don't don't just say you know here's my little world. Um, DevOps, ops, security. The organizations need to work together to provide a top to bottom secure environment. And all too often, as you'll see in container land, that doesn't happen. So above security, there are issues like governance. And that is not just the policies that can be imposed at the system level, but the policies for the organization that are auditable and will, will keep correct behaviors happening. These are some examples. This is not a recipe. Some of these may be relevant for some organizations. Others may not. And on top of that, people may be working in regulated industries where there are, such as at, you know, working in, in a um, point of sale and retail environment where, where processing cards or PC, PCI becomes important. Um, I know this is my US-centric statement now, but there are parallels. Um, OK, I'll, I'll reach out. There are GDPR considerations. There are HIPAA and other health protocol uh, considerations. So governance is obviously a pretty governance risk, pretty wide category. But here are some of the things that can be done in, in governance policy, some of which can be enforced by the system, some of which can't but need to be considered. Um, just, just looking at a few. Um, look at things that, that shouldn't run together as well as things that should run together. Um, watching demos of people shell into containers today, I was thinking, yeah, most of the time, no. There are times, and then there are times, no. Um, this is one, and as I said, that's really pretty obvious because it, it, you have to work pretty hard for this one not to happen, so that's OK. Um, you may decide the data that you want to work in an environment where all data at rest is encrypted. Cool. Some people do. Some people don't. Some people choose a space in between. We looked at secrets, um, talked about our back, and this is this is an important idea, which is that people often look at our back as it works to the system as a whole and to pods and containers. But when they think about the pods and containers, they don't necessarily think about restricting scheduling the containers to specific groups and roles. dedicated namespace for certain apps. And this is, this is one that, that really often doesn't get done also, and it's an important one, which is to do the same things for YAML files that you do for source. Version control them and control who accesses them. Finally, there's a category I'm going to call low-hanging fruit. Um, some of these are pretty easy. Some of these, I will point out, the first two we had vulnerability with at one point for, for the last reason that I'm going to talk about on this slide. Um, there are things that you can, and we should, and we are more and more, blocking and controlling defaults for that, that really you know, start the ball rolling. So, Anonymous access, the default service token, as we talked about. Um, use in admission control, 
to provide shell access to you know, control tightly at any rate who can get shell access in a privileged container. User impersonation is there by, you know, is a, is a Kubernetes capability. Um, very few people should ever have to do it. Many people should be restricted from doing it. Um, this is a goal. You know, every once in a while, you do need to enable privileged containers for some purposes. But when you privilege it, when you give privileges to a container, give the needed privileges. Use capabilities to give only the needed privileges to the containers. Uh, and we had an example of that in Cloud Application Platform, where some of its containers uh, had been running privileged, and all they really needed was one, one specific permission. So they one, one, one thing here that sometimes you can move that in the, in the container. So the container actually doesn't need to be privileged, but needs to do something beforehand. Right. And needs more. Uh, yeah, I think this is one that isn't that isn't really what we classically think of as a security issue, but if you think of denial of service as a security issue, it is. Uh, and that is that if other containerized workloads can get out of control on the machines, they can starve others. So use resource controls to the extent that you can. Um, something that on the, we turn on the fork for protection. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, then, then we have it. Then we might in, we might in house, but um, this one I think is in like two out of three presentations that are being done here on whether it's on Kubernetes or not this uh, this week. Uh, patch promptly, and then one that is it's kind of a contradiction to this. It is not really low hanging fruit. It's hard. It's just one of the most important ones to realize is that. Many of the security failures in container environments have been because the management of them has, or a great deal of the management of them, has moved from IT to DevOps. And you know, luckily there is now a culture growing in DevOps. There's DevSecOps addressing security in these domains, but by default. Somewhat for DevOps and entirely for developers. Anybody who's a developer, cover your ears. I'm going to say something nasty. Don't really start out thinking from a senior perspective. That's why there are security guys who nag them, you know, who audit them and nag them all the time. And if you're going to have more control over how applications are deployed, which in the containerized world, developers and DevOps are going to, then you need to have the same level of security interest and have to design it in from the start of the application. You, know, you can't just count on somebody who's going to secure the infrastructure around you and then you know, deal with CVEs when they come along, but let's just put up walls around everything and that will protect you. That's not going to happen from the outside in a lot of places. Um, there will probably be a shift to more involvement by operations in many of these cases as they become more mainstream. A lot of people have deployed initial applications and, and internal applications and are validating and they're growing into containers and and you know at the at the other extreme, you know, we have global scale clouds which are heavily containerized, but there's really no difference between their ops and DevOps organizations. So they have that focus, but they control the stack generally so tightly, not that they haven't had vulnerabilities of their own, but those roles are largely combined there already. But in a traditionally structured IT organization, you have to really think about security from the start, and I think that's one of the most important points here. <coughs> um, that's the meat of this part. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple other things, but um, questions? Um, I know that Suze is working on rootless containers. Can you yes. speak about that? Yeah, so rootless containers 
um, have been are being implemented in Cryo, which is the new container engine. Um, one of our guys, as you know, is doing doing the heavy lifting on that upstream, mm -hmm. and um, we're we will continue to track it through Cryo. We need, you know, we announced when we released 3.0 that we released Cryo. I said, does everybody know what Cryo is? Okay, so um, normally Kubernetes environments have used little d Docker, open source Docker, as the runtime engine. And Docker is a lot of things, right? It's a runtime engine, it's a builder, it's a repository, it does a lot of things. Um, and because of that, it has a lot of capabilities and runs fairly heavy. And um, with the coming of the CRI, the uh, standards for, for container interfaces, the, uh, there's now some more disconnect between the network, good disconnect between the container format and the ability to run it. And one of the first fruits of that is a new runtime called CRI O uh, Cryo. And Cryo, first of all, uses um, OCI format. Uh, containers, but also runs Docker file-based containers. Uh, the O in Cryo is for uh, OCI, so it's a container res uh, resource engine uh, implementation, container runtime implementation uh, based on OCI. Um, and it's much lighter weight. It, seems to be more secure out of the box because it just has much less attack surface. We introduced it as a tech preview in 3.0, partly because the tooling was kind of primitive and partly because we just frankly didn't have that many miles on it. Uh, we expect in version four that it will be promoted to fully supported. Uh, and it uses a different container building stack with, you'll so you'll probably hear the names build out with an H at the end, uh, and Scopio, and there are a few, with a K, <laughs> and there are a few others uh, that will become, you'll still be able to use Docker to build, but that will also become a, a default build environment. So uh, that's right. And uh, as I said, we'll be pushing it out as fully supported in <coughs> version four. The short answer is summer. <laughs> but come to the roadmap session anyway, you'll hear about some more. Anybody else? Did I did I get to the end of your question or did I Okay. Okay. Um, let's take a little time just to talk about security in general. Um, one thing is that we have security reviews of design and implementation. So we don't just you know, do code review for functionality or best, or best coding practice, but also for security. Uh, we have really two security teams. Um, one of them in the organization as a whole. And there's a security team inside the containers team as well. It's a little security team, but it's a security team. And they both work pretty closely together. Um, and one of the things that the security team in the containers organization does is run audits against our releases. Um, we're, we're making the shift now to doing it uh, the, way, <laughs> the way everybody would prefer, which is doing it before we release it. Um, but in version three, we did it a while after we released it. And as a result, over the last few months in maintenance, you've seen a bunch of security fixes coming through. I've blogged about the most serious of them, but there have been a lot of others that were less serious. And this is where I'm, I'm going to 
advocate another set of tools, which I, I didn't put in the slides, but I'm going to talk about uh, in a moment. Um, so we're on embargoed distribution lists for really everything we work with, where we receive notifications and remedies, or at least workarounds, uh, before they're released to the, to the public, before they're published. Um, for Kubernetes in particular, in order to be on that list, you need to be a certified distribution. So we are, and therefore we do. Um, and that allows us lead time to get a fix out when things are announced. And, and Kubernetes releases fixes for current and previous three releases. Um, and as I said, you know, patches are shipped promptly as updates. Um, one of the things that you can do because it affect, it reflects on not only how we configure things, but also and, and how we code things, but also on how you do and how you put together applications, is to use one of the common benchmark suites. And, and just run them against your masters, against your workers, uh, with some regularity. Cubehunter is one that's used quite commonly. Cubebench is a larger benchmark set from the same folks. Uh, and then um, the CSI benchmarks are a, a third source of benchmark data. And I, you know you don't need to keep these running constantly or anything, but periodic audits are a good of your own environment are a good idea. They're how we do this too. Any questions? Okay. Um, finally, there's lots more container content here. Um, in the roadmap presentation, I have actually three pages of container stuff. Um, but you still have opportunity for most of these, other than the ones that were offered only on Tuesday. Uh, and these are some of the more interesting ones and the ones that are honestly closer to having some container security content. You know, the um, identity LDAP integration is relevant. Uh, GitLab will talk, the GitLab presentation, they're going to talk about um, secure, about security. In, and scanning in the CI/CD um, pipeline. Uh, Kata containers are going to be an interesting topic. We're looking at those in engineering now. Do you, who doesn't know what Kata containers are? Anybody? Okay, cool. I was hoping somebody would say. Um, so one of the reasons people deploy are either religious about VMs or deploy their container environments inside VMs is that VMs have stronger isolation. You know, the hypervisor can, among other things, take advantage of the hardware virtualization support to provide isolation. Um, Kata containers, a project that was started by Intel, that um, though are available on Intel and non-Intel processors, um, that uh, essentially takes the HVM-based isolation of KVM and, and essentially uses a lightweight hypervisor that doesn't have all the device support that containers wouldn't need and doesn't have some of the scheduling support that containers wouldn't need and so on and then implements those as a, exposes those as a container. So it, it, it runs things that are, are kind of a thin, thin candy shell of, of VM wrapped around a container, presented as a VM, and, and managed by Kubernetes. How is that different from the LFC? Uh, good question. Uh, so LFC is still namespaced yeah. containers. Yeah, LFC doesn't have the no, much for it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, LFC is just an alternative host-based container. Right? But, um, yeah, so that's, that's cool, and we're looking at that in engineering and deciding our path 
there are, are sort of two related issues having to do with virtualization. One of them is bringing the security of virtualization to containers. The other one, um, which is largely uh, a project called Qbert, is taking VMs for workloads that aren't really friendly to containerization, monolithic apps, and being able to make, instead of um, having a virtualization control environment with containers in it, uh, being able to have standalone VMs also be managed by Kubernetes alongside containers. So that's a, that's a look at part of the, the container content. But there's also other security content that's not container specific. Um, probably, you know, one of the ones I would suggest looking at, which covers the whole domain, is the security roadmap. Um, and sorry you missed this one, which is a customer presentation uh, this morning. Um, and myself, I'm interested in that one. So I'll have to go tomorrow. Anybody? Anything? Thanks for you. Have a good afternoon.